uh, concludes the AGM and um, thank you very much everybody for participating in that and um, so the next um, part of the agenda is to uh, well not agenda of the AGM but we now move on to the um, session this afternoon so it's a delight to welcome Professor Garant Jones from UCL's Mallard Space Science Lab. Um, Garant um, did his PhD at MSSL and, um, and then did a world tour, starting off at Imperial, then going to JPL, um, and then the Max Planck, Planck Institute for Solar System Science in, in Germany, and then back to MSSL again. He's now Professor of Physics and a uh, Professor of Planetary Science, sorry, and um, uh, he's head of the Planetary Science Group. He's also lead proposer for the Comet Interceptor mission, which is going to be the subject of his talk this afternoon. And um, so, Garant, um, uh, please share your screen and, uh, and go ahead. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, Andrew. So, yeah, thanks very much for the kind invitation to um, give this presentation. So, um, yeah, I'll spend... Uh, uh, some time this afternoon outlining uh, the Comet Interceptor uh, mission. So, yeah, it's an exciting mission. Uh, we're still many years from uh, from launch, but uh, there's a huge amount of work uh, going into this. So I'll explain, uh, yeah, comet science, why is it important? Um, we've had previous comet missions, why do we want another one? Um, and then I'll explain um, some details of Comet Interceptor itself and where we are with uh, with preparations for this uh, this exciting project. So uh, yeah, my um, uh, co-authors uh, um, on this uh, talk are Colin Snodgrass at the University of Edinburgh, um, who was the the deputy um, proposer on the on the proposal that went into to ESA, um, and uh, Cechi Tubiana uh, at uh, INAF in in Rome. So. Um, as I'll explain in more detail later, the mission has um, a, a unified science team with um, several hundred scientists uh, um, being members of that, and the three of us are, are leading the, uh, the science team. Okay, so comets. Um, so um, many of you on this uh, who, are, who are listening in will remember Comet Hale Bop. Here it is in 1997 over. Um, uh, the Mallard Space Science Laboratory. Um, and it's very rare for us to get comets this bright. I mean, just in the past few months, we've had uh, uh, Comet Leonard, um, but Hale-Bopp was a spectacular sight, an easy na naked eye object for over two months in 1997. And uh, unfortunately, these are very rare occurrences when you get such a bright object for um, visible for so long. And the vast majority of comets that come along are far, far fainter than, than this. So every year we'll get uh, maybe a couple of dozen new, newly discovered uh, comets. Um, most of them are long period, but we're still adding to short period comets. I'll come to those, that differentiation uh, in a moment. So obviously before um, scientific observations started, it was a real mystery what these objects were. And understandably when they did appear, especially bright ones, um, they were seen as uh, um, portents of, of doom um, because they were appearing out of nowhere, um, no one really understood what they uh, what they were, and there are records going back now for a couple of thousand years of these objects being observed um, by uh, uh, by earlier civilizations. Now we understand them far far better. So with observations from the ground, we've been able to learn that they're made up of dust and gas, and we know the composition of that of those gases as well. And um, skipping through a lot of background, um, using Newton's laws of gravitation, uh, Edmund Halley realized that one bright comet um, kept reappearing every 76 years, and that comet now bears his name, Comet Halley. So um, comets like Halley come around regularly, so that's every 76 years. We have a couple more that um, come around uh, on, on orbital periods longer than that, closer to 200 years, but the majority of them have shorter uh, periods. So short period comets, many of them have orbits um, where they go around the sun once every five or six years or so, and they almost all have been affected by um, the planet Jupiter, and that's why they're all in, uh, or most of them are in orbits of this type. So there are short period comets like Halley and others that we, we see coming around regularly, 
There are also long period comets uh, as well. They follow orbits that take thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even millions of years to go once around the, the sun. And every year there's a small subset of these comets that are approaching the sun for the first time since they were created. So that gives a little bit of background. I know if that's a, that's a really short summary of it, but basically previous comet missions have gone to short period comets and Comet Interceptor, the plan is to go to a long period comet for the first time and uh, ideally one that's dynamically new. So coming in towards the sun for the first time. So the year before last, um, in, uh, in summer 2020, when unfortunately uh, many professional uh, observatories were closed for many months over that first lockdown period, um, Comet Neowise was a spectacular sight, and I'm sure many of you uh, listening in will have seen this object yourself. So this is a photo I took uh, in, in Germany, an early morning in, in July um, 2020, and uh, it was an amazing object. Um, again, unfortunately, the, um, sites such as these are uh, quite rare. But um, we, we were able to, to learn a lot from them using, uh, learn a lot about these objects from the ground using telescopes. Um, and, uh, but we, we, only, we only really understand the nature of these objects in great detail by sending spacecraft uh, to them. So um, the space age obviously started in the late 1950s and it wasn't until the 1980s that cometary uh, space missions uh, began. So NASA in 1985 actually did fly through a tail of a comet, Comet Jacobini Zinner, and that spacecraft didn't carry any cameras. It wasn't designed as a, as a comet mission, uh, but it did make the first comet tail crossing. Um, but it, in uh, 1986, Comet Halley um, uh, had its uh, perihelion and many space agencies planned to encounter the comet. It was the most, uh, the, the best known comet uh, it's on a very well established path around the sun. So um, everyone knew where it was going to be in advance. And so many agencies planned missions uh, to go to it. And this was actually the European Space Agency's first planetary mission, the first mission to leave um, uh, Earth orbit. And uh, the Giotto spacecraft, which you can see here, um, had a design that was based on a, on a um, uh, a, uh, an Earth orbiting satellite, but it was amended quite uh, dramatically to give it dust shields to protect it when it encountered uh, the comet. So they're at the bottom of the, the picture here. Um, and uh, so as it traveled through Comet Halley, this dust shield would protect the, the spacecraft from, uh, from these dust impacts at high speed. And it was uh, given a big high gain antenna. So this important um, line of communication with the Earth. So you can see the big dish at the top um, and this was designed specifically to encounter Comet Halley uh, around March the 13th, 1986. The angle of the, of the dish and everything was designed perfectly to encounter Comet Halley at that date and time. And it demonstrates really well that all previous comet missions such as this, um, they were to short period comets where we knew where the, the, um, the spacecraft was going in advance. So Giotto wasn't huge. You can see in that mi middle uh, panel, um, one of the instruments uh, being worked on by a, uh, by a technician there. Um, and the, the spacecraft was actually built um, in, uh, in Bristol at uh, British Aerospace, and it was launched in, uh, in 1985 on an Ariane rocket from, uh, from Kourou in, in South America. So with these first comet missions, um, there were many expectations about what would be seen at a comet, but um, the instruments that they carried um, covered a wide range of science topics. So there was obviously a camera. So on the panel on the left, um, it's that uh, white cylinder. Um, so a cylinder um, with a, a, a mirror at the top. Um, and then other sensors to detect what the gas was made of. Um, what, uh, and also to detect uh, dust grains as well and also plasma instruments, so to detect um, the ions and electrons near the comet. So neutral gas released from the, uh, from the heart of the comet um, be becomes electrically charged, and as well as seeing neutral gas atoms and molecules, we also see charged um, gases uh, as well. 
and magnetometer, which is a sophisticated compass basically to measure the strength and direction of the magnetic field. And uh, one of these instruments, the Johnston Plasma Analyzer, was led um, by a team at uh, MSSL and uh, Professor Andrew Coates was um, played a prominent uh, role in uh, the development of that instrument and studying the data that uh, was sent back from it. So Giotto was a, was a huge success. Um, so it was expected by almost everyone that at the heart of Comet Halley would be seen a nucleus. So when we see comets from the ground, we see a fuzzy um, uh, bright region. And um, the expectation was at the heart of this uh, uh, comet, all comets, is an icy um, body, maybe a few kilometers across, and uh, that it, because it was icy, it would be reflective and would be very bright. And so the cameras on Giotto were designed to target the brightest point in the in um, in the field of view. So as Giotto closed in on the nucleus of Comet Halley, as you can see here in this animation. The camera actually um, targeted the brightest point, and rather than, rather than being a, uh, a bright nucleus, it actually um, zoomed in as we got closer and closer to one of the brightest jets of material. Now, if you look closely um, in the wider view, like now, um, the nucleus is actually really dark and it's slightly backlit, so you can see the shape of it, and the, the brightest parts are the jets. Um, so this was one of the very big discoveries. So comet nuclei are dark. They don't reflect much light. So they're as dark as coal. So only around two or three percent of the light or the sunlight that falls on them is reflected um, back uh, to the observer. So um, we now know that comets are covered in uh, thick layers of, of dust or short period comets are at least. Uh, and this was um, shown again with, uh, with the Rosetta uh, mission. So as I'm sure uh, almost all of you know, Rosetta was a very ambitious European Space Agency mission that rather than fly past a comet like uh, Giotto did at Comet Halley, um, it was to visit a comet, um, meet it when it was still far from the sun, and then match orbits with it and come in towards the sun flying alongside uh, the nucleus. And that's what it did uh, very successfully. So here on the left is a, an animation of, of images taken by Rosetta. And you can see uh, the nucleus of comet churyumov gerasimenko uh, with jets of gas and dust coming off it. So you can see the solar panels of Rosetta there in the, in the foreground. And Rosetta traveled alongside the comet from uh, 2014 uh, to 2016. Um, and we learned a huge amount about this particular uh, comet. So what exactly it was made of, uh, what gases came off, what the dust was made of. There were different types of dust, fluffy dust, and also really compact grains. And also we learned about how the solar wind, this flow of, of um, uh, uh, charged particles from the sun interacts with the, the comet uh, as well. Um, also, Rosetta dropped a lander down to the surface, Philae. Uh, so in November um, 2014, it was dropped down to the surface and unfortunately didn't land and stay put as expected, but bounced around for a, um, a while afterwards and eventually came to a rest next to a, a cliff. Um, it did return really valuable data for a couple of days until its battery ran out. But then until the end of the mission, uh, no one really knew exactly where on this nucleus uh, feli was. And then uh, um, Chechi Tubiana, who's now a close colleague on Comet Interceptor, well, um, bet between preparing dinner one evening towards the end of the mission in 2016, she was checking some images that had come down from the OSIRIS camera, and she spotted this, this very clear image, you can see it on the right, of feli lying, uh, lying there on its side with one leg up in the air, uh, and that's where it had actually landed. So um, in those last couple of weeks before the end of the mission, uh, we established where Philae exactly was on the nucleus and so could put all the observations it made from its uh, landing site in, uh, in context. So there are many other um, comet missions as well, which um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into now, but we've had Stardust that has returned um, dust from a comet. That was a NASA mission. Also NASA deep impact mission, 
that hits the, the, um, the nucleus of another comet to see how hard it was. It turned out that it is actually quite hard. Um, and it left a, um, a smallish crater on the, on, uh, on the surface. Um, so, and uh, also the Deep Space uh, One mission as well, which was more of a technology demonstrator, but also returned valuable data from, uh, uh, from another uh, comet. But all these missions, were sent to short period comets because when you send a spacecraft to to space with these valuable instruments to to measure what a comet is like you want to know where you're going and that short period comets that were targeted because um the um the that's the only those are the only comets we know where exactly they're going to be uh well in advance so just to change topic very briefly as this is uh, hot news from this week um, there are also other unexpected comet encounters as well. So not exactly with the comet nucleus, um, though we did have a, a comet called Siding Spring that got really close to Mars in, in 2014. Um, but um, there are comet tail crossings, uh, which are, um, I mean, they're not exactly common, but they're not as rare as you might expect them to be. And the latest one of these uh, was a tail crossing by the Solar Orbiter spacecraft only last month. So um, I mentioned earlier that uh, the, the solar wind with this flow of particles from the sun interacts with comets uh, as well. And it carries away these charged um, molecules and atoms away from the comet, and that is the iron tail. So this usually bluish tail, um, which you can see separate from the, from the dust tail in, in bright comets. And Comet Leonard, as many of you will know, was a, was a very impressive uh, object for those in the Southern Hemisphere. Yet again, the Northern Hemisphere, we lost out. Uh, it was quite nice from the Northern Hemisphere, but uh, a few weeks later over Christmas, it was really spectacular uh, for those south of the equator. Um, so on December uh, the 17th, um, just last month, um, Solar Orbiter actually um, unexpected, well, not unexpectedly, but unplanned, in a plan, unplanned manner, crossed the iron tail of, uh, of Solar Orbiter. So this graphic shows you where everything was in the inner solar system at the time. You can see the Earth there on the, on the right with Solar Orbiter fairly close by after having made a, a close encounter with the Earth in November. And Comet Leonard um, on December the 17th was approaching um, uh, planet Venus. So Comet uh, Leonard, so this is uh, C2021A1, um, was actually in a retrograde orbit. So the, com the, uh, the planets are going around um, in an anti-clockwise direction, looking from the north. And you can see from that green arrow, uh, Comet Leonard was going around in the opposite uh, direction. Um, so a PhD student here at MSSL uh, was working on finding where, when these comet tail crossings occur, and he actually spotted that um, Solar Orbiter had a good chance of crossing the tail, so that the, um, the science team on the mission had a couple of weeks' notice that this was uh, likely to happen. And when it did happen, uh, it wasn't just Solar Orbiter observing. The SOHO spacecraft, which studies the Sun, also observed um, Comet Leonard. Um, the Stereo A spacecraft, which you can see there at the, at the bottom, a NASA mission also was looking at the, the comet from the side. And even the Parker Solar Probe, which is um, over on the left in this view, uh, saw the, uh, the comet from a great distance uh, as well. Um, so this is actually a view um, from Solar Orbiter itself. It's a mission, uh, it's a space, sorry, a, an instrument called Solo High. So that's Solar Orbiter Heliospheric Imager. And um, if we go back a moment, um, so this, the, this uh, brownish wedge you can see looking towards in the direction of Mercury from Solar Orbiter uh, is approximately the field of view of that instrument. So it's looking to the bit to, a bit to the left of the Sun and Venus and Mercury are in the field of view. And here you can see the view from uh, Solar Orbiter. So you can see Venus, which is the bright pack brightest object at the top there and Mercury on the right. And you can see um, a region fairly close to the, um, the, the heart of the Milky Way as well uh, towards the right. And if I run the movie, uh, you can see a really nice view of um, Comet Leonard sweeping past in front of the, uh, the Milky Way and um, moving down towards the lower left. And during 
the period when these images were taken, Solar Orbiter was actually inside the iron tail. So um, it doesn't show up in these uh, unprocessed images, but um, we're actually looking along the tail of uh, Solar Orbiter um, while this really nice animation uh, was shot by the instrument. So I'll just play it one more time. And if you look at the top, you can see Venus and Mercury moving against the background stars uh, as well. So all following orbital dynamics um, as they orbit around uh, the sun. So um, at the, the top left there is, uh, is my um, <laughs> image from the back garden here in Guildford of uh, Comet Leonard on uh, December the 8th, when it was still visible in the Northern Hemisphere. And then uh, this moving uh, sequence of images are here on the right, shows the data from uh, one of the solar orbiter instruments as it went through the tail. I know there's a lot to take in here, but I'll point out um, the key information. So this instrument, which is um, one of the sensors on, on the solar wind analyzer, SWA, which is also led from MSSL, um, measures ions in the solar wind. Um, and as it crossed the tail, uh, it detected extra ions, which you don't normally see in the solar wind. So these are actually labeled. So you can see um, the, the white labels. You have uh, oxygen, carbon, water ions, uh, carbon monoxide ions, and carbon dioxide ions as well. So normally we just see hydrogen and uh, helium um, ions with a few other species as well. But as we were crossing the tail, many other um, ions were seen as well. As you can see, these patches appear along these lines, these colored lines corresponding to the different uh, molecules and atoms in the, in the iron tail, or um, uh, ions of molecules and atoms in the iron tail. So this very early days, the, the data only came down a few weeks ago, but uh, clearly a uh, very nice um, additional um, set of data on comets and how they interact with, uh, with the solar wind. Okay, let's move back now from the tails to uh, comet nuclei. And this montage shows views of uh, several different comets that have been visited. So right in the middle is Comet Halley. So uh, one of the larger ones that have been visited or well, the largest active comet nucleus that has been visited. So measured approximately 16 kilometers by eight by eight. This is actually an image from a Soviet led mission called Vega 2. Um, and you can see Rosetta's target comet at upper right, that's uh, 67P. So you can see it was much smaller um, than the nucleus of Comet Halley. But um, yeah, they, they all typically measure a few kilometers across. Um, the, the nucleus of Comet Hale-Bopp in 1997 was probably of the order of 50 or 60 kilometers across, so much larger, which is why it was so bright. Um, and you can see a couple of these objects appear to be two objects that have come together. So um, Chirimov Grazimenko has two parts which um, have been likened to a, a duck. We also see that Comet Hartley 2 also appears to be two objects that have come together, Borelli and Halley uh, as well. And then over on the left, we have an object which is not a comet. Um, but it's actually uh, an object called Arakoth, which is beyond the orbit of Pluto and was um, flown past by the, um, the, the New Horizons spacecraft uh, a couple of years ago. So this is an object out in the Kuiper belt, which is one of the sources of, uh, of comets. Uh, Arakoth is in quite a stable uh, orbit, so it probably won't be a comet in the future, but objects like it have moved in towards the sun in the past and become uh, comets. So um, Arakoth, the object on the left, um, which again is a double object, um, is the type of object from um, the outer parts of the solar system that later become uh, comets uh, as well. So um, yeah, the, the, because many of these nuclei appear to be objects that have come together, it tells us a lot about the environment in which they were formed. Uh, objects are probably moving um, slowly with respect to each other, otherwise they'd have smashed, smashed each other apart. Um, and uh, you can see that it's probably more common than not to see some of these objects of, as having come together. Um, and they're believed to be the planetesimals, the types of objects that built up um, the Earth and the other planets. So 
By studying comets at close range, we see the building blocks of the planets and um, we can rewind by a few billion years um, what the solar system was like. So um, one of the primary reasons for studying comets and understanding the nuclei is to learn more about what the building blocks of the solar system uh, were like. Okay, we'll come on now to Comet Interceptor. So um, the European Space Agency every few years issues a, a call for mission uh, proposals. Um, and in uh, 2018, it announced one uh, which was the first of a uh, new class of mission called an F-class mission. So um, uh, it's uh, meant to, um, in, to mean a fast class mission, so a shorter development time than is usual for um, missions for the European Space Agency. So these calls come out um, every couple of years, as I said, and there's actually one open at the moment. So there, is, there are many teams of scientists in different areas, um, not just planetary science, but astrophysics and solar physics as well, all busily working on proposals to submit to ESA uh, in July for the next uh, missions of this type and larger uh, ones as well. Um, and when these calls come out, ESA sets, uh, um, makes clear what the constraints are on the mission. So for this, um, the maximum cost for the European Space Agency had to be 150 million euros. Um, and then as is usual, especially for planetary missions, the, uh, the member states of the European Space Agency uh, fund the instruments that, carry, that are carried on the spacecraft and the science teams as well. So the scientists in the, the member states that will work on the data that, uh, that come back from these instruments. Um, for this call, um, it was for a spacecraft to launch with a mission that had already been selected. So the Ariel Exoplanet Telescope and they're going to a point in space uh, called Lagrange Point L2 and uh, would launch in 2029. Um, also, the, the launcher was specified. So as you can see here, or see here on the right, it's an Ariane 6-2. So the Ariane 6 hasn't flown yet. Uh, obviously, the, the next model in the Ariane uh, series, and um, we should see the first launch of an Ariane 6 um, in the next year to year and a half. Um, so I've mentioned um, where, why we want to visit comets and that all previous missions have gone to um, short period comets. So just to, to make it clear, this is what the, the case that was made uh, to ESA. So Comet Interceptor is a mission targeting a long period comet, preferably dynamically new, means that it's coming in towards the sun for the first time. So it's um, so not changed by going past the sun many times, or if we're really lucky, an interstellar object. So that's a, a comet or asteroid coming from another star system and just passing through our solar system. So um, I won't return to this, but I'll just say very briefly that we know of two confirmed interstellar objects that have been found in the past few years. Um, we'd have to be extremely lucky to find one during our mission and travel to it, uh, but we could in principle do so if we're really lucky. So. Um, uh, we always mention it, but we're realistic. It's it's unlikely that we will get to an interstellar object. So um, the the primary aim is to go to a long period comet, uh, preferably one that's coming in towards the sun for the first time. So why, as I've said before, all previous missions have been to short period comets. So every time a comet such as Churubov-Gerasimenko here on the left goes past the sun the surface changes. We saw as Rosetta was observing uh, this comet, um, that there were cliff collapses. We actually saw um, features disappear as the ices that were in the um, surface sublimated away, so uh, melted away, turned to gas. Um, and um, all these nuclei are very dark. Maybe, we don't know without actually visiting one of these objects, maybe a comet that hasn't been past the sun uh, before is brighter, that we might be able to see more of the surface ices and that they haven't been covered in a thick layer of, uh, of dust. Um, so these objects are pristine. I mean, something that was said many times during the Rosetta mission, that this was a visit to a pristine object. The material is pristine, but the surface of, uh, of this comet and other short period comets have changed. 
since the comet was um, first formed. And if we go to one that's approaching the sun for the first time or has only been passed a couple of times, then we'll see uh, a, a surface much more similar um, to uh, what was put down um, billions of years ago when the solar system was forming. So how are we going to do this? Um, <laughs> right, so um, we need to find obviously a target before we send a spacecraft uh, to it. And the only way to go to a long period comet is to find one as it's coming in towards the sun and to find it very early. So very far away uh, from the sun and from the earth. Now it's a, it's a really exciting time because um, in the next year, a, a new observatory uh, will open. It's, it was formerly called LSST, now called the Vera Rubin Observatory. You can see it's on the right there. It's in the process of being built in Chile. And it's a very powerful survey telescope that will map the entire sky from um, the site in Chile every four to five nights. Um, so it has a wide field of view and will map the entire sky over a few nights and then start again. And it will um, serve many areas of astronomy, including cosmology, um, stellar physics, galactic um, studies, and planetary studies as well. Um, it probably won't increase the number of comets that are found, but it will find them further away. So um, surveys such as NEAT and NEOWISE have been finding comets now, which otherwise would have been found by amateurs. So there are fewer and fewer amateurs that are finding uh, comets, and it's expected that uh, the Rubin Observatory will find many of these comets before anyone else has a chance, because it'll be finding them very far away from, uh, from the sun. So with Vera Rubin starting up, we know that we'll be able to see comets further away, which gives us more advanced warning of, uh, of which comets are coming in and where they're going to be. Um, but even with this advanced warning, um, it's still, or except probably in a handful of, of cases, it's still not enough time to, um, to plan, build, uh, and launch a spacecraft um, to encounter any of these uh, objects. So this is a, a great plus that we can find comets far away from the sun as they're coming in. Uh, but uh, if you don't have a spacecraft ready to encounter the comet, it's still not enough time. So Comet Interceptor will solve that by launching and waiting. So uh, Comet Interceptor is being built so it can encounter all kinds of comets. So I mentioned right at the beginning that Giotto was in, designed to encounter Comet Halley in 1986 in March, and uh, it was designed exactly uh, for that flyby. So um, our mission has been designed to go to all kinds of comets, whether they're very active, very weak, and we don't know in advance um, what the flyby geometry will be. We'll be going to go up the tail, down the tail, across from side to side. So it's being designed to cope with all those different types of, of flybys. Um, so it's going to be launched to go to Lagrange point L2. So um, this is a point one and a half million kilometers further away from the sun than the earth. And it's a relatively stable place. Um, so if you put things there, they do drift away after a few weeks, um, but it's um, a fairly stable place and you don't need much fuel to, to stay there. Um, and it's actually where the James Webb Space Telescope arrived uh, earlier this week. And uh, so when Comet Interceptor and Ariel are launched in uh, 2029, they'll be going to um, L2. So it isn't, well, it is one point, but objects that go there, they're put in orbit around L2, basically. They, they don't sit at one point, so there's no chance of bumping into um, um, the Webb telescope or anything. Um, space is very big. Um, so when, once Comet Interceptor gets there, um, it can wait. Um, and then when we find a suitable cut target, uh, we leave L2 to encounter uh, the comet. So there are many, many challenges. Um, so um, Comet Halley and Comet Leonard, they are retrograde uh, comets. That means they're going around the sun the opposite way uh, to the planets, to the Earth and the other planets. So any spacecraft we send from Earth is going around the sun the same way as the Earth as well. So if we send a spacecraft to one to a comet that's uh, in a retrograde orbit, it's a bit like driving up a motorway 
on the wrong side. So um, the flyby speed is much higher because the, the spacecraft and the comets are going in opposite directions. Um, but we're including that possibility in the design of the spacecraft. So we may encounter comets at speeds greater than 70 kilometers per second. So Giotto going through Comet Halley, um, that flyby was 68 kilometers per second. It did survive. Um, so we know that if we build shielding equivalent to Giotto, uh, we should be able to um, survive encounters uh, for Comet Interceptor as well. Um, but um, if we go to a comet that's going around um, the sun the same direction as the Earth and the other planets, the flyby speed would be much lower. So maybe 10, 20 uh, kilometers per second instead. Still obviously really fast but uh, not at these ridiculously high speeds for uh, retrograde um, comets. So overall, because long period comets come from all directions in the sky, um, the, the typical speed or average speed is about 50 kilometers per second, but we can cope with flyby speeds all the way from 10 kilometers per second up to beyond uh, 70. Um, as I said before, we can't predict our path through the comet, so um, we can't um, have a big dish pointing towards the Earth during the encounter, sending back the data in real time. Uh, and also the, the limit on the cost of Comet Interceptor means that the uh, entire mission should be shorter than five years in duration. So that's actually being extended a little to about six years limit now. So even if a spacecraft is uh, sitting in space doing nothing, it still costs money to run. You need a team of, uh, of engineers and navigators to um, check on the spacecraft at L2 every two to three weeks. And the cost of doing that builds up over time uh, as well. And the spacecraft, um, obviously it's been designed to, to be quite robust and stay in space for long, but the longer you leave it in space, the, the higher the risk of radiation damage and things um, leading to it uh, to reaching the end of its, its life. So some of the solutions are that we have a limited radio link to the Earth. So the encounter, we're only sending back a small amount of, of data and uh, storing the rest on board for um, transmission later. We'll have dust shielding equivalent to that on, uh, on Giotto. The way to L2 is limited to around three years. And so if we don't find a suitable long period comet, um, then we have short period comets as backups as well. So one of these is 73P, which you can see here on the right. Um, and if we do go to a backup comet, um, then we will be carrying out new science. So there are instruments on the spacecraft that have not been carried to uh, comets previously. Okay, so, um, so what does this look like? So just a few cartoons um, uh, to... Uh, set this out um, possibly more clearly. So the ellipse here shows Earth's orbit. Uh, so we launch uh, in late 2029 and we go into orbit around L2, like JWST now, the Webb Telescope. Uh, and then we wait there for two to three years uh, for a new target discovery. There's a small chance that we might even find a target to get through even before launch, but we're planning that we'll have to sit at L2 and wait for uh, a comet th uh, that we can get to, to be found when we're already in space. So during this wait, um, Comet Interceptor won't be carrying out the search itself. It'll be observatories on the ground, such as the Rubin Observatory, that will be finding comets as, um, as is done routinely now anyway. But each new um, comet that is found, um, we work out the, uh, the orbits, and we work out where and when it's going to cross the plane of the Earth's orbit. So this plane um, is called the ecliptic plane, and we don't have the fuel needed to go up or down, north or south out of this plane. So the encounter, the flyby, has to be in the plane of the ecliptic. So for each new comet, we find where it's going to cross the ecliptic. So in this case, it's circled. Um, and that's the only place where we can encounter it. Um, unless we're lucky, there might be um, on the way in and way out, maybe um, we could reach both of them in, the, in a few cases. So if we, when we do find a, a comet we can get to, we leave L2 at the right time and head for this um, point of interception. Um, and during the cruise for a few months or maybe a year or two, the comet gets closer and closer to the sun. We expect the dust tail to grow, the iron tail to grow. 
So at the encounter, um, we have an active comet that we fly past and we, uh, we're visiting a, uh, a long period comet and even possibly a, a new one that hasn't been close to the sun uh, before. So just to demonstrate that objects like this are being found, um, last year there were two comets listed here um, that were found in July and August that could have been reachable if Comet Interceptor was in space uh, now. So an obvious question would be, what are the chances that we will find a target? So it's around 70%. Um, there are constraints on how close to the sun and how far away from the sun the, um, the, we can be because of the design of the spacecraft um, and thermal controls. Also, we have a limited amount of fuel. We don't know exactly how much we'll be able to carry yet, but the expectation is that um, uh, um, we'll be able to get to about 70% of, um, we, we have a 70% chance of getting to a long period comet during our, uh, our mission and ESA have accepted this as, a, as good odds. <laughs> So um, the mission is not only an ESA one, so it is led by the European Space Agency, but the Japanese Space Agency, JAXA, are also making a, a significant contribution uh, to the mission itself. And we actually have three spacecraft, a main one, which for now we're calling A, very imaginative, but uh, I'm sure we'll have a, a, an alternative name um, at some point. And this main spacecraft will fly past the comets at a safe uh, and yeah, modestly distant um, uh, distance from the um, uh, from the nucleus. So this is probably be going to be around a thousand kilometers from the nucleus. So it sounds quite far, but um, the the camera that we'll be carrying is quite powerful. It would still be able to see um, the the surface of the nucleus at a resolution of a few meters. And then the two smaller spacecraft B1 and B2, they'll be released from spacecraft A. Uh, a day or two before the encounter with the comets, and they'll both go slightly closer to the nucleus. Um, so the closer you go to the nucleus, there's more dust. And at these ridiculously high speeds, um, it means that it's more risky. So if a dust um, grain hits the spacecraft at these high speeds, we could lose one or either of them. Um, so we accept the fact that it's risky going that close to the, the nucleus. Um, but it's high gain as well. So we, we get more signs um, if, they, if they work. So um, we're addressing this by these two spacecrafts sending their data to spacecraft A in real time. So if either or both of them is lost due to a dust impact, then at least the data they'll have stored um, will be safely on board spacecraft A up to the moment at which we, we lose them. So, um, ESA have, uh, um, after selecting the mission in, uh, in 2019 and in early 2020, they confirmed that the, uh, the mission is doable, that they believed <laughs> the proposing team that we put together a, uh, a realistic plan for a mission. Um, the scientists reviewing it are also are very happy with the, with the science plan and agreed that it was really exciting to be doing this. So ESA have awarded contracts to two um, groups of, uh, of companies to design um, the spacecraft, or at least the European elements of the, of the spacecraft. So one is Thales Alenia Space, leading one consortium, and OHB Italia uh, is leading um, the other consortium. So you can see that the designs of, um, uh, from these two artists' impressions are fairly similar. Um, solar panels, a box in the middle, and the two spacecraft, uh, small spacecraft, B1 and B2, attached um, to it uh, as well. So these two teams have been working independently uh, and not sharing information and, and sort of designing um, the, uh, the spacecraft uh, independently and the guidance provided by ESA on what exactly um, the payload, the, the instruments that the science instruments that we're providing uh, need to do. Um, and then sometime later this year, one of these teams will be selected as the prime contractor. So they'll get the contract to actually build uh, the spacecraft A and probe B2. Right, instruments. So um, obviously we want to be carrying um, scientific instruments to study the comet in, in great detail. So I won't go through this list in, in, uh, in, uh, in great detail, just touch on a, a couple of them. So the main uh, camera uh, called COCA, which is short for Comet Camera, is, is led by Nick Thomas at the University of Bern in Switzerland. 
and it's actually heavily based on a camera carried on the ESA ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter uh, mission. So that camera is, is studying Mars, um, and um, many of these instruments are based on uh, instruments that have flown on previous missions, some of them operating now, like that camera on, uh, on Trace Gas Orbiter. Um, also, we have uh, MIRMIS, which is an infrared um, instruments which will take images at different wavelengths in the infrared, including the thermal infrared, so we can measure temperatures on the nucleus. Um, and that's led by Neil Bowles at the University of Oxford. And then we have MANIAC, um, which is a mass spectrometer. So it'll, similar to, to SWA, which I showed earlier on Solar Orbiter and Comet Leonard, seeing what um, gases are present, but it'll be looking at neutral gases so before they're electrically charged and ions as well. And again, that's led from the University of, of Bern by, by Martin Rubin. So um, I'm just listing <laughs> the leads of these instrument teams, but for all of these teams, there's a, a, there's a big consortium of typically three, four, five uh, different groups around Europe working together to build uh, these instruments. Um, and then on the right here, we've got probe B1. So that's the Japanese probe and all the instruments on this one are being provided from Japan. So that's to save costs as well. There aren't instruments from Europe flying on this and, and Japanese instruments on the, the European spacecraft. And on B1, we have um, a, uh, an instrument to measure uh, the um, ions near the comet and also the magnetic field. Uh, two cameras and a hydrogen imager. This is an ultraviolet camera that looks at hydrogen around the coma. And then B2 um, carries a, uh, an instrument called uh, ENVIS, which stands for the entire visible sky. Um, and it'll map the entire sky around the small probe, uh, looking at how dust scatters uh, sunlight, learning more about uh, the dust. And uh, hopefully we'll get images of the, the jets coming off the nucleus as well. Um, and there's also a camera on that called OPIC, uh, led from uh, Estonia, and that will be the first Estonian instrument to fly on a, an ESA mission. And then on the next slide, there's a whole suite of sensors um, to look at the dust, magnetic fields, um, and uh, plasma as well, so these charged particles. So on spacecraft A, B2, and B1, there will be a magnetometer. Um, so we'll have multiple measurements of the magnetic field um, from these three locations as we go past uh, the comets. Um, and the one on uh, the small probe B2 um, is led from Imperial College. So Marina Galland is uh, leading uh, that team. So um, yeah, these sensors measure the electrons, the ions, also energetic atoms. Uh, so these are neutral atoms um, that uh, due to swapping charges with, uh, uh, with ions, they fly out of the comet at high speed. So uh, it'll be exciting to see what uh, that instrument sees. So we haven't flown an instrument like that to a comet previously. And then we also have dust instruments called DISC on spacecraft A and B2 uh, as well. Okay, so as these three spacecraft are going past the comet, we'll get complementary views. So um, spacecraft A, the furthest one away, has the most powerful camera and will undoubtedly return um, the, the highest resolution images. Uh, but the other two probes will be carrying, carrying cameras as well. So we'll get a, a slightly different viewpoint, which will help generate three-dimensional um, uh, maps of the, of the nucleus uh, as well. And this is what the flyby will be like. So you can see spacecraft A at the bottom there going from right to left. Um, so the, the camera, so just this is just a cartoon, obviously. So um, we'll be tracking the nucleus and the infrared instrument Miramis led from Oxford will also be doing the same. So um, the spacecraft um, will fly past and the, these two cameras, um, visible and infrared, will be tracking uh, the comets as we go past. And all the other sensors obviously making instruments as well, the mass spectrometer scooping up um, gas around the comet and measuring exactly what it's made of, what molecules and atoms uh, are there. And then the two probes, B1 and B2, are sending their data in real time to spacecraft A. So while all this is going on, there's limited communications with the Earth, just a um, small amount of data just to confirm that the, the mission is, um, that the spacecraft is still uh, 
still there and operating and B1 and B2 will send their data in real time. And as I said earlier, if either of them is lost, then at least the data will be stored on spacecraft A. And then after the encounter, the, uh, the main antenna will be pointed at the earth and will start streaming the data down to the ground. So that depending on where the encounter has taken place, that will take between weeks and months. So if it's very far from the earth on the other side of Earth's orbit, then it will take many months to do this. But if the comet happens to be close by, then uh, it should be done in, uh, in a few weeks. Okay, so where are we with the, the mission? So I said already we were selected in uh, 2019. And during uh, that year, um, there was a detailed study of the, the mission held at Estec, an ESA facility in the Netherlands. Uh, so you can see it here on the photos on the, on the right. So their engineers, uh, navigation software people all, all came together and looked at our proposal in detail. And by early February 2020, they approved the advancement, um, which was basically the formal selection of the mission and saying, yes, that we should uh, proceed with this. And then um, in November 2020, these two industrial teams started their parallel mission studies. So last year, we had uh, full detailed reviews of all the instruments and the spacecraft uh, as well. And right now, um, we're gearing up for um, another series of reviews of all the instruments, um, all the um, national funding agencies. So in the UK, it's the UK Space Agency, which is funding our involvement in the science team and uh, the instruments at uh, Oxford and Imperial. Uh, they confirmed to ESA they'll fund the, uh, the instruments. So all the different countries have said, yes, um, we'll definitely fund all these instruments. So ESA should uh, go ahead. So after this next round of, of reviews, in June of this year, we're, uh, if all goes well, and we're expecting mission adoption. So this is where ESA tell all the member states um, we should go ahead with this. And uh, if all goes well, then the, the member states will uh, rubber stamp this. And then the flight instruments, the ones that will actually go into space, will start to be developed and built. And the prime contractor will be selected later this year as well. So one of those two industrial teams will proceed with actually building uh, the main spacecraft and spacecraft B2. And our colleagues in Japan will start on building spacecraft B1 uh, as well. So uh, I'm skipping out a lot, <laughs> skipping over a lot that happens over the next few years. Uh, but at the moment, launch is scheduled for December 2029, which seems a long time away, but I'm sure it'll rush up to meet us in, in no time as we've seen with previous missions. So over on the right here at the bottom, a photo of Colin Snodgrass at Edinburgh and uh, Chechi Tubiana as well at one of these um, industrial, uh, sorry, at the concurrent design facility at uh, STEC. So briefly, amateur contributions. Um, so many of you will remember that um, for the Rosetta mission, um, ESA were keen to get observations of Comet 67P so in 2015, 16, unfortunately, the comet wasn't fantastic. Um, it wasn't placed particularly well for observations from the Earth. It's actually been much better for the recent perihelion passage. Um, much nicer images of uh, Comet 67P over the past few months, now that that comet has come back to, to perihelion. Um, but um, so the nature of Comet Interceptor is we're looking at target objects which are still really far away from the sun. So when they're discovered, they're still very faint. Um, and most of them will probably be uh, out of the reach of, of, um, of most amateur astronomers. But uh, if there are promising targets that come along, uh, then we'll definitely be keen to, um, to get um, information about these um, objects from uh, the amateur community as well, and I'm sure we'll publicise uh, this more widely uh, when we when we need that uh, support. And then in a few years' time, um, you know, amateurs can potentially track the brightness of potential targets, and once they become active, um, you know, how um, extensive is the coma, the dust coma, and also the tails as well. And if the final target, the mission that we're actually going to, is bright enough, then clearly the um, the science return from the mission will definitely benefit greatly from, uh, from amateur observations, many of which will be far better than my photo here of, uh, of Comet Leonard uh, a month ago. 
Okay, so this is the last time um, we met in person, the science team, that's the last time we met in, in person. Uh, this was in Granada in Spain in December 2019. Um, we had another meeting in February 2020 at ESTEC for a subgroup of, uh, of this team. And uh, there were rumors then that, um, oh, there was, yeah, this um, virus in China was spreading and uh, that uh, they actually called off the last day of that meeting and they sent us all home. Um, ESTEC actually clamped down on, on travel very early on. And then we all know what happened. We all went into lockdown. And despite all that, um, all this progress was made. And um, ESA have carried on working on this. We on the science team and the instrument teams have as well. And uh, frankly, it's quite remarkable that we basically stuck to the original timescale for all of this. Um, uh, now, of course, we're all meeting online, as you can see here. This is our last science team meeting, full science team meeting in, in October. Um, uh, and but I said this a year ago, but hopefully in 2022 we'll finally meet again in uh, in person. And uh, looking forward to adoption if all goes well in June of this year. And uh, exciting times as we lead up to the launch of the mission uh, at the end of this decade. So uh, here I've, I've put a link to um, the website for the the science team, Comet Interceptor Space, and the Twitter handle, and then my Twitter handle as well. And then at the bottom there, if you want to learn more about the Comet Leonard tail crossing that I mentioned earlier, there's a short link to that as well. So that's Solo Leonard, um, Solar Orbiter Leonard. Um, so thanks very much for your interest. Um, and uh, yeah, for, again, for the invitation to share the excitement of this mission with you and uh, be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Geraint. Amazing talk and uh, amazing mission and uh, really exciting. And um, I think we can't wait until uh, until we get to <laughs> going towards the comet. So there's um, while people um, think of questions and, and put them in the chat, I see there's a couple of questions already. I might just ask one myself to start with. So, so um, if um, you mentioned uh, getting to L2 and the time that spending at L2 and the 70% chance of finding a good target. So if we get to the end of the L2 time and um, we haven't found a target, can we stay there a bit longer and wait a bit longer? Um, well, yeah, we might make the argument that we should wait a bit longer, but we, yeah. Yeah, we have a list of backup uh, targets, uh, as I mentioned in passing. Um, yeah, frustratingly, the best of the backup targets, like Comet 73P, I had an image of that, which is a comet that actually split up in, um, first in the 1990s. So we know that that's a nucleus that broke up quite recently. So we could be seeing the a cross section of a, of a nucleus if we visit that. Um, that's moving down the list now, because to go to that, we'd have to leave L2 in, um, I think, 2033 which is a bit early. Uh, we'd rather <laughs> sit around for a bit longer and, and hope that a um, long period target comes along. So um, yeah, we, we have backup targets and we'll have a ranked list. Um, so we have an idea of what the approach will be and the, the time scale. So yeah, we'll probably have to leave, seeing that the, the maximum weights, at, uh, oh, sorry, maximum length of, of mission is now six years then we probably can wait there for up to four years, waiting for a suitable target to come along. And then uh, we'll very reluctantly have to go to one of the, the backup targets, but still do fantastic science, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, we're hoping for a, a long period one. Great, thanks very much. So, um, so there's a couple of questions in the chat. So, so first of all, will the missions interfere with JWST L2? So I think you answered that during the talk actually. But... Um, yeah, but, but it's, it's a fair question. Yeah, so L2 is a, a location in space, but it's um, but JWST, which has just arrived there, is in a big looping orbit around there. It's, it's similar to the orbit of the moon around the Earth, I think, um, similar size. So um, if you just think of two satellites in orbit around the Earth at a similar distance, the chances of, of them getting close to each other and, well, even interfering with each other, with each other is extremely slim. I mean, maybe we'd cross the field of view of um, of even either Ariel or or JWST. Uh, I think it's unlikely, but that might happen. But uh, yeah, the the chances of of that occurring are, are very slim. I think. Yeah. 
Um, and a similar question from Martin Willick again. So how, how wide is the L2 volume? So it's a similar similar sort of thing. It's a, it's a big area of space, I guess. So yeah. Yeah, it's it's big. And I'm sure ESA would have um, yeah sounded the alarm if, uh, if it was a problem. But there are also other spacecraft already yes. there. So Herschel and Gaia that were previously launched by ESA are, uh, are there already as, as well. Um, and uh, yeah, the, uh, there's a similar location on the other side towards the sun from the Earth. So L1, that's where SOHO and a few, uh, so Discover and a few other spacecraft are there as well. And I'm not aware of any issues with any of those getting close to each other. So it's it's quite safe sending spacecraft to these locations. Indeed, yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, so just another question. In your research, you've also used amateur images of, of spacecraft of, of comets for um uh, for other reasons maybe maybe just sort of mention that a little bit yeah sure so it's, it's something i had to leave out because um yeah i, know. I could easily be here for two or three hours yes. with the countless slides but yes we um so for bright comets where we can see the uh the iron tail um we can actually use the comets as uh wind socks basically to measure the solar wind so um the, the solar wind is this really fast flow of, of uh, particles from the sun. So they flow, so it flows at hundreds of kilometers per second. Um, and comets, as they move around the sun, the, um, the, the gases that are released, they become ionized, they're charged, and they join the solar wind. So you get the iron tail forming, uh, or the plasma tail, which you can see as a bluish line. So as Many of you will have seen Comet Leonard last month, some spectacular images of that comet showing its, uh, its iron tail. Um, and obviously we can learn uh, something about the, the comet itself from the, the iron tail, but for studying the solar wind, so how fast uh, the wind is flowing as it comes off the sun, um, we, it's expensive to send spacecraft out there to, uh, to measure um, the, uh, the solar wind speed. And we can actually do it at a rudimentary level by looking at the, the, um, the direction of the iron tail. So uh, yeah, we've gathered uh, many hundreds of images of iron tails by amateurs. And usually we do this by sending out calls to the community for images. Um, and we can actually convert these images into estimates of the solar wind speed. So for free, we get um, measurements of the, the solar wind speed uh, as well. So. If the target comet for Comet Interceptor is bright enough, then obviously we'll be hoping to do this uh, as well. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a it's a nice uh, bonus, I think, to to get um, solar and solar wind science uh, out of uh, comet observations uh, as well. Absolutely, thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, so there's a few congratulatory messages in the chat about the talk. So really, people enjoyed it and. Um, uh, so a couple of other questions as well. So how will the spacecraft be fueled during its long way to L2? Yeah, good question. So, um, well, one thing about the, um, the amount of fuel that we can carry is that we don't yet know the exact performance of the Ariane 6 rocket. Um, so, um, yeah, something that may not be immediately obvious is that... Um, the yeah the masses of um the of the instruments that we carry on spacecraft are really um <laughs> scrutinized closely so the european space agency will assign a mass to an instrument saying it has to be 2.85 kilograms or less and that's it you can't go over uh, or if you try that you have lots of arguments ahead of you um and this is because there's um sending things into space um yeah, you have to be as efficient as possible and they have to assign different masses to the, the weight of the, I say weight, you know, all know what I mean, correctly, it's mass, uh, the, the weight of the spacecraft itself, the solar panels, all the hardware, the, the instrumentation that runs the spacecraft and you have allocations for the instruments themselves. So um, the, the Ariane 6 uh, rocket has been designed. Um, there are very good estimates of how it should perform they're probably on the conservative side, uh, but until the first launch of Ariane 6 happens, we don't know uh, for sure. So the spacecraft is actually being designed with a fuel tank, which is slightly larger than we uh, formally expect it to, to need to be. 
But if Ariane 6 works really well and they say, oh, there's actually 50 extra kilograms that you can carry on the spacecraft, then we'll top up um, that fuel tank. So it, the capacity is larger than what we expect it to be. So if Ariane 6 launches uh, is, is a really efficient launcher, then we may be able to carry more fuel, which gives us a bigger range of comets that we can, we can get to. So that's why I haven't given an exact number to, to how much fuel we'll actually carry. We won't really know this for another year or two. Yeah. Great, thanks. Okay, and I should have mentioned that was from Sheila Godwin, that question. Yeah, thank you. So another question from Stephen Karp. Um, so once the spacecraft completes its encounter with the selected comet, can you use it for anything else afterwards? Uh, yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we've, we've been very careful uh, with this. So when you propose a, a, a mission and DISA gives a very hard maximum budget for operating and the duration of the mission, um, in the proposal, you have to stick to that. If you if you go beyond those boundaries, you're automatically rejected. Um, and as we prepare the mission, everything is um, concentrated on getting to this primary target and carrying out the science. That's everything that we're concentrating on now. But after making that flyby and getting all the data on the ground, if we still have an operating uh, spacecraft, then clearly it could go on to other targets. So Giotto, for example, after the Comet Halley uh, encounter, actually went on to a second comet, uh, Griggs Gellerup, in uh, July 1992. So you can squeeze out more science out of uh, these missions as well, and Deep Impact and Stardust also did the same, went to other comets, so those NASA missions. So yes, in principle, the two probes... Um, uh, B2 especially, that's battery powered. So once it, that operates, it can't go on any longer. Um, the B1 spacecraft, the Japanese one, that will have solar panels. So that could in principle operate for longer, but it's a really small spacecraft. So in principle, yes, but we're not planning any of that now. We'll see how things are after the encounter. But yeah, clearly it's something that we, we do bear in mind. Yeah, Indeed, fingers crossed, yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. I think that's probably all the questions, unless anybody has got a last... Oh, hang on. Um, do it in another meeting. Okay. Fantastic talk. Yeah, so lots of congratulatory messages, and thank you very much for answering all the questions and uh, and for the, the wonderful talk. So thank you again, and um, uh, that's... Yeah, see you on Monday. <laughs> yes. Okay, <laughs> okay. and um, uh, so we now continue with um, the rest of the meeting. So we have uh, a, a short break now, but after the break, uh, so Robin's schedule will give us a short presentation about what's coming up in the sky for the next three months. And the SBA's planetary section director, Alan Clitheroe, We'll talk about the value of amateur observations of the planet. So actually, that is relevant to um, to Garant's talk as well. So um, uh, so we'll take a break for about ten minutes and um, come back at three forty, and we'll restart then. Okay, thank you very much.
I'll be doing my talk shortly.
Okay, so hopefully everybody's had a good break and chance for a cup of tea and a rest and so on. And uh, so in the second half of the meeting, um, we're going to be, first of all, having a talk from Robin about, um, about what's coming up in the sky for the next three months. So Robin, of course, uh, is one of the vice presidents of the SBA. Okay, thanks. Hi, thank you very much indeed. Right now, the battle of sharing my screen. Uh, which one's the PowerPoint show? That looks like it. Yes, I think we're there now. Okay, um, this is what's coming up in the next <coughs> three months until April 2022. Although it's winter and therefore the, there's plenty of night time to view the sky, one of the problems with this particular year is that there are virtually no bright planets to see in the sky. I'll come to that right at the end because Mercury will be visible right at the end of this period. But we will have to make do with viewing the stars, viewing a bit of stargazing. And of course, the object which we usually look straight towards is, is Orion. And that is a, a very popular object to look at. And the number of pictures I get of the Orion Nebula and the Horsehead and the Flame Nebula for the showcase is testament to that. People, uh, these are popular targets. And the, um, the <coughs> there's Orion looking uh, as this is the this evening at about half past eight. And you can see Orion well placed for viewing and all the other wonderful objects in the night sky at the moment. And uh, what I always try and do is to <clears throat> look at some of the less obvious objects that you can see. Now, Orion, as I say, down there in the southern sky, um, Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, Aldebaran, and above it, the uh, constellation of Auriga with three clusters of stars, M36, 37, and 38 in the middle, Perseus there, Cassiopeia, and the double cluster about there in between the two of them, the Andromeda galaxy, you can see it's... Uh, rather exaggerated on this view, there it is. But nevertheless, this is a wonderful time of year to do a bit of stargazing, one of the best of the lot. And Orion there, as I've shown you that picture already, you know how to find the Orion Nebula below the three stars there. I say you know how to find it, but I've heard people online saying, I'm having trouble finding it. So, this is the, the way to do it. Uh, you, you you look at that for that little group of stars. You won't see three bright objects there so easily with the naked eye, particularly if you have a light polluted sky. But that shows you where to look anyway in that area there. And you will see the Orion Nebula looking not a bit like this. There's two of the bright stars. But this is the sort of picture which we all love to take showing the Orion Nebula as time exposure, obviously, uh, coming out very prominently. Visually, the colours just aren't visible. And I must say that this was a picture taken, this is the picture taken using a digital camera, and the colours are more muted to those we were accustomed to getting in the old days, back in the last century, really, with film, where the Orion Nebula inevitably came out as, as a bright red object. But on digital, the colours are more muted. They're no more accurate in many ways. But there's, uh, there's a bit of uh, red in there and a bit of blue as well. So it's a popular target. Also, just faintly visible on this are two other objects which people like to aim for photographically, the Flame Nebula there. And the horse head nebula, you can't quite see the horse head itself, but it's <clears throat> immediately um, uh, visible just underneath that star there with um, a, a quite long exposure on a photograph to, to get it to come out. Visually, it's very difficult to see. So don't expect to be able to see it with a small telescope in a typical sky. But I want to draw your attention to, as I said, we're, we're going to be having to do a bit of stargazing. Since there's no bright planets. I think Jupiter is just still around down in the western sky, but not so that you would be able to make detailed observations of it. <coughs> this is, if you uh, draw a line through Rigel to Betelgeuse and then continue going, uh, you may not have quite this orientation, particularly earlier in the evening, but this is towards the end of the period, uh, you will come to the constellation of Gemini. And I've used this 
rather um, short exposure photograph to show the constellation itself with the two bright stars, Castor and Pollux there, and two lines of stars. The, the, the lines represent the two twins. This line here is, is the, the, the twin Pollux, and this line down here is the is Castor. So uh, those are the, uh, the, the, often you hear people refer to by uh, Castor's right, right foot or something like that, which would be uh, about here. But that's why you do get that. It, it's one of the most uh, graphic constellations in the sky. It, okay, they don't like, like two, two, two boys um, close together, but you can uh, see how the, you could join the dots to get the constellation of Gemini there. Here's a photograph which I did using a diffusing lens, uh, diffusing uh, filter, I should say, <coughs> not of the whole constellation, bits of it are missed out there, but this shows Castor and Pollux very clearly, and you can see the difference in colour there. It's a wonderful trick to play if you have a diffusing filter, uh, you don't actually need to use a anything that you buy in the shop, sometimes just a bit of um, a, a bit of uh, misty glass put over the top of the lens will do the trick or if you're very lucky the mist will come along in the sky of its own accord anyway and uh, maybe mist up the lens slightly in which case the colors of the stars will show up very very clearly and uh, there you are the, you can see that Pollux is definitely the more yellowish of the two stars visually I must say I struggle to see Castor as looking blue like that but uh, you can, when you compare the two colours, then you can, there's two stars, you can see their colours relatively well. And if you use binoculars, that certainly intensifies the colour. So do have a look. But also cast your gaze over in this direction towards, as I was saying, Castor's left foot. And look at these two stars. Now, those two there are really very prominently coloured. In, in binoculars and you'll see them as uh, a very strong reddish color in fact even stronger than as shown in this photograph and also i want to look at the cluster m35 which is just there so the, one of the th advantages of gemini is that it there are plenty of really bright reasonably bright stars which will help you find the object so if i go to that little area here now they can see those two stars mu Geminorum and Eta Geminorum, and the colours have come up quite obviously in this photograph. Um, they, they are really strong colours, so take a look through binoculars if you think that Betelgeuse and maybe Antares uh, are the only two red stars in the sky. Think again, have a look at these two with binoculars and you will see the colours very strongly. And here's the cluster M35. Now this is obviously a, a a close up view of the area and you will if you are in a, uh, a light polluted sky you won't see the cluster m35 looking anything like as clear as it does there but it's it's relatively easy to find from those two so do take a look you will see it as a a, a thin scattering of stars if you don't have a dark sky if you have a problem finding it uh, with binoculars and you have a telescope try using a telescope and you will find that the increased magnification darkens the sky background and the, the, the stars, however, say the same brightness. So the net result is a greater uh, visibility of the stars and improvement in the signal to noise ratio. Now this little misty patch down there is actually not a fault on the photograph. I'll show you that in the next picture. This is one I took uh, a while back with a CCD camera and it brings out the colours again really prominently. You can see that the majority of stars in M35 itself there are of quite bluish colour, one or two red giants in there as well. Uh, I think those are part of the cluster. But if we look down at this object here, which again comes up really strongly in a CCD photograph. This didn't require a huge telescope to take, this was just taken with an 80 millimeter refractor. But one of the features that we have to get used to these days is that objects which we could, certainly when a lot of us were younger, you could see relatively well in a suburban sky. 
now are becoming less visible and you certainly need high power higher power binoculars or telescopes uh, to see them at all but photographically you can pick them out straight away and this is uh, a saving grace really uh, that electronics have come to our res rescue where we couldn't see these objects and in just a very short exposure on a small telescope like a, an 18 millimeter or even smaller you can see objects which have been invisible for decades to the naked eye even with a big telescope so that's one of the reasons why in popular astronomy we do talk a lot about imaging but at the same time i don't like to forget those people who either don't want to or don't have the facilities for imaging it is a palaver there are telescopes these days which take all the palaver out of it but at a cost but nevertheless that's another story one that we'll come to in the uh, in a future edition of popular astronomy i might say in the may issue you'll see something about these telescopes but going back to this picture this is ngc 2158 <clears throat> and notice that the stars there are a different color in general from those of m35 and that tells you a lot straight away um, that the stars in M35 are much, the M35 is a much younger cluster with all these bright blue stars that only last a few million years. Compare that with the lifetime of the sun of 4.5 or 4.6 billion years. And look at the stars in NGC 2158. They're predominantly red in color and none of these bright blue stars. It is clearly an older cluster not only is it older, but it is also much farther away. The distance of M35 in the, the next outward spiral arm is about 3,900 light years. And that of NGC 2158 is something like 11,000 light years. So very much an outlier in our galaxy. You might say it looks like a globular cluster, which indeed it does. There are pictures of globular clusters that look very similar to that, but I read on that wonderful place, Wikipedia, that it's now regarded as being uh, a, a, an old open cluster that just hasn't um, hasn't separated out. It's obviously in a sort of intermediate stage. So that's something for you to look at. You won't see the colours necessarily with a telescope or binoculars, but have a look for those. Now, I mentioned bright planets of which there are none as Mercury, uh, sorry, there's uh, Uranus and Neptune in the sky. Uh, Uranus is, is quite well placed for observation until uh, the end of March, but uh, that, that requires a bit of finding. But also at the end of April, in fact, this is really just before our next meeting, which is on April the uh, 30th, I think it is. And um, this shows what you would be able to see in the evening sky, this is Mercury's best apparition this year. A spring appearance of Mercury around that time is uh, April, March, April, is always much better because the ecliptic is at a steeper angle in the sunset sky than, uh, or the twilight sky, than it is at any other time of year. So if the sun is way down below uh, the horizon here, but Mercury coming round, um, uh, and uh, reaching its greatest elongation from the sun uh, in this way. It looks, it, doesn't it, as if, because I, I, this is a series that I took using uh, Stellarium, and I just superimpose one picture uh, every day, one top of the, 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 the picture for the 20th of April, which shows the stars as well. And it looks as if it's getting farther away. That's not the case. It's actually farther away on the 20th of April, it's actually on the farther side of the sun at that point that is on the 29th. So don't be misled by the appearance of this, which shows the brightness. The brightnesses are a bit exaggerated here, but you can see that actually its greatest elongation from the sun is on the 29th of April. And that you might think would be the best chance to see it, but it's actually a <coughs> got a larger diameter uh, or larger visible area, I should say, as seen in the sky earlier in its appearance. So its actual closest to the, uh, sorry, the actual 
point of dichotomy, that is when it's a half phase, is actually on the 24th, so 20th, 21st, 23rd, 24th. So you've got to judge when's the best time to look for it. Don't necessarily wait until greatest elong elongation, eastern elongation, because uh, that you'll find the, the planet has de decreased, although it's farther away in the uh, from the sun in the twilight and higher in the sky, its brightness is less. So look sometime between the 20th and about the 28th if you want to see Mercury. Um, incidentally, when it is on the 29th of April, the Pleiades are just about there. They will have moved in the sky and sunk um, a bit more in the sky, but I don't think you'll see them. So that's Mercury, and that's something to look forward to just before the uh, the, the, the next meeting at the end of April, and maybe I'll be able to show you pictures of that at the uh, in the next talk I give. Uh, and finally, let's talk about the Lyrid meteors, which again are towards the end of this period, uh, on the 22nd of April. Now, the Lyrid are one of the faithful showers that we usually see. They're not a very strong shower, it's got to be said. There's what I what's termed the ZHR, the zenithal hourly rate, is 18 to 20, which is actually compared with the Perseids or the uh, Geminids of 80 or 100, um, uh, comparatively low. But they are there, and that is the zenithal hourly rate. Now, uh, the, the, the Lyrid uh, radiant won't be in the zenith during the, the night, so you won't get see that number. You might be lucky to see half that number, maybe one every 10 or 20 minutes. So don't expect a, a, a huge shower this year. The, the rates have gone up to about 80 or 90 in the past, but uh, we're not expecting that this year. Um, this is where to look. This is looking east, and this view is uh, sky for about three in the morning. And the radiant, where the meteors come from, is fairly close to the star uh, Vega in Lyra, just to the to the right of it. And the radiant does change uh, from night to night, but uh, not, not substantially from the point of view of working out if it was a, a Lyra or not. Uh, the radiant rises about 22 hours um, BST, uh, which we will be in by that time, of course, and so it uh, you need to it doesn't get dark until quite late at night anyway, and uh, you need to wait until then to start seeing lyrid meteors, and it's best around three a.m. and not long after that it starts to get light, so it's an all night session if you want to observe the lyrids, uh, but that is something to look out for. And uh, here is a picture of a Lyrid meteor taken by Paul Sutherland, who is a great supplier of wonderful photographs. His balcony looks east and uh, it's over the sea, so he gets some quite dark skies down there in Kent. So that's something to maybe emulate if you can see a Lyrid meteors. OK, that's all there is from me about the uh, 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 about the what's up in the sky now. I'd like to hand over, in some sense, to Alan Clitheroe, who's our planetary section director. Uh, one problem, he's probably at this very moment saying doors to manual. He's a Jet 2 pilot, and he said he's going to be in Tenerife. This is one reason we've, very, we've never actually been able to get Alan down to a live meeting of ours, because the the schedule of, a, of an airline pilot is very subject to change and he can never predict just when he's going to be free. But this was an ideal opportunity for him to give a talk to us because being by Zoom, it meant that we could actually record his talk and give it even though he's now down in Tenerife and if he's not saying doors to Manuel, he's, he's uh, walking around the, uh, the, 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 the foot of the plane uh, just checking the tyres and the pressures and all that sort of thing just before he takes off back to back to Scotland. So what I'm going to do is I've recorded his talk and that's what I've got to find now. Hopefully it's this one here. So I'll now hand over to Alan and his talk on the amateur contribution, contributions to astronomical science, which actually is mostly planetary ones. And I can say it's a very good talk. So Let's play that one now. Right. So, um, uh, yeah. Let's okay. through. That's fine. That's uh, in your own time.
<laughs> well, that's very kind of you. Um, thanks very much indeed, Robin, for that introduction. Uh, the first thing, obviously, that I need to do is apologise for having to record this little talk, not being there in person. As, but as been said, sadly, work gets in the way. Uh, this, I suppose, for me, has the one advantage of meaning that I won't have to answer any questions at the end. But uh, I'll get on with it. Uh, when uh, I was first asked to give a little talk like this, uh, my first thoughts were to talk about something I I, I know a fair deal amount uh, about, which is astrophotography and particularly planetary astrophotography. Um, but Robin kindly pointed out that the subject had rather been done to death recently uh, with meetings and seminars, etc. So could I perhaps talk about something else? And we came up with uh, amateur contributions to the science of astronomy. And it turns out that this is a pretty enormous subject. But before I get onto it, I just couldn't help myself but to put this picture up which is from one of our regular contributors, uh, Martin Lewis, who's a prize winning photographer and has written articles for the uh, SPA magazine. Uh, this is his Parade of the Planets of 2021, which I think is particularly lovely and uh, shows you what an amateur can achieve. Um, and now I want to talk about what other amateurs have achieved. And a quick search on Wikipedia really produced some rather enormous lists. So, uh, this is uh, famous amateur uh, astronomers, a long list there. And just below this, there was discoverers with major contributions by amateur astronomers. So there's a very, very broad subject. So I did have to kind of narrow things down uh, to be able to get things in in a reasonable time. So what I've done is I've gone back, uh, believe it or not, to 1662 and King Charles II and uh, I want to talk briefly, it's a little story actually, that it's probably not true, it's probably a legend invented by the Victorians, um, but uh, with that in mind I'll go on with it. In 1662 uh, King Charles, who had a great interest himself in the natural sciences, issued a charter to allow groups of gentlemen to meet regularly in, in London to discuss what was called natural philosophy, uh, which we would understand as science in general and would definitely involve astronomy in particular. Uh, you might wonder why he had to issue a charter to allow this, but you have to remember that this is not an awful long time after another group of gentlemen got together in London to discuss how to blow up the Houses of Parliament. So uh, it was important for the institutions at the time to control this sort of thing. So Charles issued his charter, but he did have a personal interest he had uh, some telescopes of his own, and of course he did appoint this gentleman, uh, Johannes Flamstedius, or as we would call him, John Flamsteed, to be his astronomer royal. <laughs> I did find one reference which suggested that uh, Charles did this because uh, it was suggested to him it would be a good idea by the mistress of the then uh, King Louis of France, uh, though it didn't report under what circumstances this suggestion was actually made, which is probably for the best. But we're getting together here, uh, the King, John Flamstein, and these men of natural philosophy, uh, all of whom are interested in astronomy uh, a very great deal. And it's said that all of them on occasion, Flamstein in general, but all of them on occasion, met up here at the White Tower within the complex of the Tower of London uh, in order to do observations. Obviously, Flamsteed was commissioned to uh, uh, make a proper map of the sky. It was all to do with navigation and determining latitude, um, correction, longitude, longitude, uh, get it right, latitude was quite easy. But Flamsteed complained vociferously that his instruments and the King's instruments were getting covered with uh, uh, white material here. Um, and I'm sure some of you will remember uh, the Nobel Prize winners, uh, Penzias and Wilson, who uh, discovered the microwave background radiation by accident while researching microwaves. Uh, they had this constant electronic noise in their machines, uh, which at first they thought was down to the very large quantities of bat and pigeon poo that was to be found inside their antenna, which in their papers they referred to politely as white dielectric material. Uh, well, the white dielectric material affecting Flamsteed uh, turned out to be raven poo. Uh, so he apparently demanded the ravens be driven away from the Tower of London. 
but one of the gentlemen attendees, it is reported, pointed out to the king that the legend that the kingdom would fall if the ravens left the Tower of London. Uh, so as a result, it was Flamsteed who was driven out uh, and he went on to establish the great observatory at Greenwich, uh, which is part of which you can see down here, the octagon room at Greenwich. I know it's a fanciful story, uh, but it allows me to talk a little bit about these influential groups of gentlemen. But I couldn't help just showing you this picture which I found, which is the octagon room at Greenwich um, from the inside. And now I, it's just out of interest. Uh, I think this picture can only have been commissioned for one reason, and that was to be sent to the uh, King's Revenue Department to justify the enormous expense of the observatory because if we look at his professionals here we've got one professional gallantly rendering himself blind staring at the sun while another professional studies in great detail an incredibly tiny patch of blue sky or possibly a pigeon while somebody in the background recalls it all in great detail but uh, undoubtedly the royal observatory did great work but what i'm talking about here now are these uh, amateur gentlemen of influence and what they did for astronomy subsequently um, there were lots of societies that formed fairly rapidly uh, as we move into the 18th and 19th centuries and it's certainly true there were many ladies uh, in the ever-increasing number of societies uh, such as Agnes May Clark um, and her sister Ellen, who wrote a very interesting book on Venus, both amateurs, obviously. But it's perhaps sad to, to say and true that early on membership was dominated by um, urban middle class professional men or men of independent means, <coughs> pardon me, with a spare time and money to devote to their astronomy. And I think that's probably regrettably true until well into the 20th century. Um, but having said, we're now looking at the contributions of amateur astronomers. I am going to have to narrow the field down considerably. Um, I'm interested in the planets, so I'm going to limit comments from now on to amateurs who greatly promoted uh, amateur astronomy in general. So sort of sparking an interest in planetary observing as part of their efforts or to those amateurs who made discoveries directly from their observation of or search for planets. And if I didn't do this, we'd still be here in several hours. So who should we start with? Well, it's difficult to know where to start. And I did ask a lot of people uh, for suggestions. I'm going to include a few of their suggestions. Um, but a few people mentioned the Reverend Thomas William Webb. Uh, it's one of several reverend gentlemen, as we shall see. Now, he was a keen and dedicated general observer, uh, but he was very good at popularizing astronomy. And also, he put out papers on the making of do it yourself silvered reflecting telescopes, the grinding of telescopes, uh, which are obviously particularly suited for planetary observing. And he made lecture tours and did a great deal of writing, uh, which helped spark the formation and expansion of astronomical societies in Britain. Um, one of his books, just out of interest, is called Celestial Objects for Common Telescopes, uh, published in the mid-19th century. And I, I found online that a first edition of this now sells for around two and a half thousand pounds. So if your astronomical society is in need of a bit of cash, it might be worth looking at the back of the bookshelves to see what you can find. Um, like many others before and after him, the good reverend kept very extensive records of his observations. And all his records are stored with the Royal Astronomical Society. And that's true for a lot of people I'm going to mention, and also later on uh, the BAA. And as Robin has suggested to me when we were having a little uh, email exchange over this, these records are a great source of data searching, data mining for people who want to look into uh, the atmospheres of the planets, particularly the gas giants. So these records are very extensive and they are available. Um, they may be the source of the odd PhD if people want to look into them. But from a professional point of view, virtually all planetary observation up until even the early 20th century was carried out by amateurs with very relatively few professionals really showing interest in the planets other than as tools to discover the dimensions and dynamics of the solar system. So for instance, in the 18th century, there were the expeditions to see the tran transits of Venus. 
it wasn't because they were particularly interested in Venus, it was to determine the size of the astronomical unit. That was the sort of thing that professionals were looking at. So you can ask questions like, when was the discovery of the Great Red Spot? And you'll see discovery there is in quotation marks, uh, because when I went and had a look into this, if you look into it in a shallow sort of manner, you'll see it was discovered by a chap called Carl Walter Pritchett, who was a professional working in America. But it's not true, he didn't actually discover it. It was well known to amateurs well before this. All that Pritchett did was make the sort of first concerted professional study of the spot. Uh, and he received considerable public attention uh, for this, but its presence had long been known before. And in my research, I was pleased to find a paper uh, published in 1890 in a periodical called The Observatory, which researched exactly this, the early history of the Great Red Spot. And it was written by someone who simply signed themselves as A.S. Williams. And this turned out to be one of the great amateur figures of the time, uh, Arthur Stanley Williams. And I'll come back to him in a minute and discuss a few of the things that he did. But looking through the article, it was interesting to find that while Cassini is said to have seen a large spot on Jupiter, and at the, indeed at least one of, a, of his pairs of sketches does show some spots on Jupiter, there's little confirmation to exist that this was actually the Great Red Spot itself. It may have been a, 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 a forefather of it, a predecessor of it. Indeed, Williams records that if it existed in the late 18th and early 19th century, um, it was not red at all, but appeared instead as a large white hollow in the otherwise uniform South Equatorial belt at Jupiter. So that brings me on to somebody who did discover and noted in particular this hollow in 1831, who was a, a German amateur called Samuel Heinrich Schwab. Now, I'm not entirely sure I've pronounced Schwab correctly, so please forgive me if I've got it wrong. I'm sure somebody knows better than I do, and German is not my best language. Um, but Schwab did uh, observe Jupiter a lot, but that wasn't his main obsession. What Schwab did, uh, he was looking to discover a new planet orbiting inside the order, uh, the uh, uh, orbit of Mercury. Now, that's actually a very difficult thing to do. And Schwab decided that the best way of doing it was to use the transit method uh, to look for a small uh, dot of a planet transiting the face of the sun. Now, this is what some of my pictures from uh, previous transits of Mercury, and here you can see the dot of Mercury, but you can also see a large number of sunspots, some which could easily be confused uh, with a planet in transit. So Schwab had to eliminate all the sunspots, and he did this in a, 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 a well, from 1826 to 1843 on every available day that he could, he recorded sunspots in order to eliminate them so that he could find the inner planet. Um, he didn't find an inner planet, but in the mass of data that he collected, uh, he discovered instead a periodic cycle of peaks and troughs in sunspot activity, which he at the time postulated to be around 10 years in length, peak to peak. Now, he just published this as an amateur paper in a German periodical, and it did catch the attention of some professionals. Um, there was Rudolf, Rudolf Wolf, uh, who was the director of the Bern Observatory in Switzerland, and he added to some of Schwab's observations. But collectively, and more importantly, these were later picked up by a gentleman called uh, Alexander von Humboldt. Uh, he was another amateur. He was a German gentleman of private means. And in translation from the German, he was described as a polymath, geographer, naturalist, explorer, and proponent of romantic philosophies, including astronomy. So I thought it rather nice to find that our astronomy is a romantic philosophy. Anyway, he wrote an important multi-volume work called Cosmos, a physical description of the universe. Uh, well, not quite right. There you go. Cosmos Alexander von Humboldt. I did wonder if Carl Sagan used this multi-volume work as inspiration for his own stuff. But anyway, von Humboldt 
formalized the work that was done before and recognized the discovery of a regular solar cycle. Um, and Schwab was, however, accidentally credited it with its discovery. Uh, and this is one of the most important discoveries in solar astronomy, which actually isn't bad for an amateur, I think. Uh, sadly, I couldn't find a copy of Schwab's Jupiter picture showing the bay in the South Equatorial Belt. Uh, well, that's not quite true. I could find a picture of it, but I wasn't, I wasn't actually prepared to pay the copyright fee to download it. So forgive me if I haven't included it here. Um, what I have done is just put up a slide with a, a drawing from a, a, a periodical from 1910, which gives you a rough idea of some of the Jupiter pictures that were around at the time. These go back to 1879, uh, all the way up to 1910. I think there's eight separate observers in there. One of them up there, Molesworth, is somebody I'm, I will mention a little bit later on. Uh, it gives you an idea of some of the pictures that were being hand-drawn at the time. Uh, but moving on from there, Schwab was a contemporary with somebody I'm sure you will have heard of, uh, William Rutter Dawes. Um, he started out as a physician, but later on he became a clergyman, that's yet another reverend uh, in the astronomical circles, uh, with several observatories, including a large one in his, his own back garden. Um, there does seem to be a disproportionate number of, of clergymen studying in astronomy at, at this time. I'm not really sure what this is, says about the morals and beliefs of the amateur observer in general. But anyway, Reverend, uh, the Reverend Dawes, as well as being well known for his extensive work measuring separation of double stars and also the empirical derivation of Dawes law, the Dawes limit, uh, how much you can resolve with a telescope of any given aperture. He was a very meticulous planetary observer. And he's one of several amateurs credited with the independently discovering the faint elusive inner C ring, the crepe ring on Saturn uh, during a favorable opposition in 1850. I say several because you, at this time, of course, there was no instantaneous communication. So there were several people who found it and claimed it, and Dawes was certainly one of them. And he was awarded the gold medal from the Royal Astronomical Society in 1855. Uh, and he had a crater named after him on the moon and both on Mars because he did extensive Mars observations too. And his drawings from the favorable opposition of 1864 of Mars were turned into a map by this chap, uh, Richard Anthony Proctor. The caricature here was published in Vanity Fair. Uh, and because they published a character of it, we can infer that he was a, a well-known socialite and a bit of a man about town. Um, and he started amateur astronomy as a man of private means, uh, but he made some unfortunate investments in South African banks, went bankrupt and had to fall back on writing uh, in order to make a living. And he started by publishing a, a, a very big, learned, serious tome uh, on Saturn, which cost him considerably more to get published than he actually made from selling it. So what he decided to do was to fall back on writing a wide range of easy to follow books and pamphlets and periodicals, uh, all on the subject of amateur astronomy for the ever growing market of amateurs in the country, um, including one book which he, he called Half Hours with the Telescope, which ran to over 20 editions into the early 20th century and uh, kept him in money well into his old age. And it, when reading about him, it did occur to him that he could actually have acted as a, a model for the learned and but understandable astronomy education uh, that we lay, got later on from Sir Patrick Moore a hundred years later. It was that kind of uh, didactic presentation that he gave. But anyway, here is Proctor's map drawn from Dawes drawings. Uh, it's not the greatest of copies. In fact, I think I can just zoom in on it a little bit. There you go. Um, I hope you can see it follows a sort of general assumption of the time that Mars, like Earth, had water oceans and continents. Um, and if you have this assumption in mind, then your drawings will tend to follow the belief of distinct coastlines with sharp edges rather than subtly shaded transitions. 
um, you will notice that there is, for instance, up here a, a Cassini land, there's a Herschel continent, a Laplace land, uh, there's Herschel again, Kepler up here, Copernicus. Uh, so Dawes was naming what he could see after famous people, but you can also see a Dawes ocean here and a Dawes continent just there, um, from which you might conclude that William Rutter Dawes was not overly modest. But it's interesting to compare his map uh, of 1864 data with the later work from uh, Giovanni Schiaparelli in 1877 and uh, the professionally produced map by Percival Lovell uh, from the Lovell Observatory, Flagstaff, Arizona in 1895. And here you've got uh, sort of large open areas of water as drawn. The areas of water still exist in Schiaparelli's map and in fact, Dawes Ocean is still marked here, but some of these linear features have started to arrive and Schiaparelli actually called them, being Italian, he called them canelli, meaning linear features. Uh, but of course, this was interpreted by a lot of people to mean canals and certainly it was an obsession of Percival Lovell, the professional, uh, who believed there was a grand civilization on Mars who was uh, using the canals to pipe water from the frozen poles to the desert regions. Um, I'm not quite sure what you can draw from this, uh, other than people sometimes draw what they expect to see and they try to confirm their obsessions. But as far as a map is concerned, you might just be able to recognize here this being Certis Major with the Hellas Basin below it. And over on Schiaparelli's map, Dawes Ocean is in fact Certis Major, and here is the uh, Great Basin above it. Uh, so it becomes less obvious in the earlier map what feature is being referred to. And you might be forgiven for thinking that the quality of telescopes was deceiving the eye of the observer. That isn't really true. I mean, Lovell used an excellent instrument, a 24 inch refractor, but he did simply draw what he expected to see. Um, I'm just going to put up a contemporary image for these, not of Mars, but of Saturn, uh, by a Leeds amateur called Simon Scriven Bolton. Uh, now, he was using a six inch refractor uh, to make his drawings, and I think you can see they are of very, very high quality and great detail. So the uh, instruments available were very good. Um, Scriven Bolton was recognised as being an exceptional artist and observer and in fact Leeds University to this day still remembers him in its annual Bolton lecture series which always follows on an astronomical subject. But from the same period I'm going to go back briefly to Arthur Stanley Williams who I mentioned earlier he gave us that useful article on the early history of the great red spot and Williams was a really dedicated planetary observer and he wrote some very influential papers which sparked interests with the professionals. Uh, in 1896 this one, the drift of surface material on Jupiter at different latitudes and in 1899 this one. Um, he too was a gold medal a winner for his amateur astronomy and He's also uh, the man who invented the naming convention we have for the belts and zones that we still use today and is used by professionals and amateurs alike. And he got a uh, recorded number of spots on Saturn and he had both lunar and Martian craters named after him too. Uh, I must mention um, Percy Braybrook Molesworth. He was one of the drawers of a Jupiter picture that appeared earlier in that collection of pictures. He was a career army officer, um, so had the advantage of being able to operate in Africa uh, when he wasn't fighting one or other colonial wars. Uh, you, many of you will obviously know of Dr. Richard McKim, who's the current director of the Mars Observing Center uh, section of the British Astronomical Association. Uh, Dr. McKim has described Molesworth as having been one of the finest planetary observers alive with the detail that he recorded. And Molesworth expanded on the work of Williams and in 1901 he recorded in detail the appearance of a great south tropical disturbance on Saturn, something that hadn't been seen before, oh, sorry, 
on Jupiter, something that hasn't been seen before. Um, this is a darkened stretch of the South Tropical Zone. And he, the one that he did, discovered persisted from 1901 to 1939. And there have been at least seven more uh, appeared and faded away since then. The latest is an, uh, an active area of study uh, for the Juno probe. And although it doesn't look like much here, from one of the Juno uh, passes, the Perigeove passes of that particular probe, you can see this darkened belt appearing. Uh, there's developments from an area called Clive, Clyde Spot, which is a, another amateur discovery, which I'll come to in about five minutes time. Uh, who else can we mention? There's a few others. And before I move into the modern day, we should mention uh, somebody who gloried in the name, the Reverend Theodore Evelyn Rees Phillips, T.E.R. Phillips. And he's another gentleman who worked very hard to popularise astronomy and planetary observation. Um, he edited and co-wrote this splendid book, well, Splendour of the Heavens, for amateurs in 1923. And he gave a great deal of <coughs> public lectures, which were described as vigorous and dramatic. Um, and so he may also have been a, an inspiration a little bit for Patrick Moore, who followed along that lines with some of his uh, public lectures. Um, T.E.R. Phillips was lucky enough to own a 12 and a half inch Culver reflector, which was also the big telescope that Molesworth was using. You saw a picture of it just before this. And he also had an eight inch Cook refractor, which he used for micrometric work. And this, this kind of shows the dedication and the amount of time that amateurs have been able to apply to the study of the planets. Um, Phillips made more than 30,000, that's 30,000 separate observations of the transit times of various objects crossing the central meridian of Jupiter allowing an accurate analysis of the wind speed movement and rotation rates of the belts and zones and jet streams on that planet, laying a foundation for the study of, of weather on the outer gas giant planets, a sort of exometeorology, if you will. I do actually have a picture of him here. I think uh, he's a stern looking gentleman. I don't think you'd want to uh, debate with him his, uh, his sermons on a Sunday. But anyway, I've spent quite a bit of time here now banging on about Victorian and Edwardian gentlemen observers and their undoubtedly significant discoveries and how professional interest followed on but as we move into the uh, into the 20th century obviously uh, there was improved and widespread state education and wide availability of decently paid jobs with some leisure time and that sort of real explosion in uh, interest in, in uh, amateur astronomy generally in the public and uh, a growth in astronomical societies but i can't leave this sort of era of the old boys without mentioning uh, this particular chap will hay uh, portrayed here as a good old schoolmaster himself uh, if you don't know him will hay was actually not a schoolmaster he was a world famous actor in British comedy films, uh, particularly between the two world wars, and often portrayed schoolmasters as part of those films. But in fact, he was a polyglot, a polymath. And uh, this was a surprise to me, especially with, when you consider him being the owner of that face. He was also uh, reputedly a bit of a ladies man. Um, there was a Wilhay biography published in 1978 entitled Good morning, boys, echoing a repeated line from one of his films. Uh, but quite by chance, before Christmas, I heard a radio programme, a repeat on uh, Radio 4 Extra, which had a famous actress, Doris Hare, talking about her life. And she toured with Hay between the wars. And she said the biography should really have been called Good Morning Girls. Um, so clearly, uh, Will Hay was another uh, romantic philosopher. But that's not what he's famous for. Uh, he was a dedicated private observer. He built a lot of instruments himself. If he couldn't buy one, he made the parts. Uh, this, for instance, was the working end of a, a chronograph recorder, which he built from bits of Meccano and a, a gramophone a record motor. 
But what is really well known for in astronomical circles was the discovery of a huge white storm spot on Saturn in uh, August 1933. And there he is on the right with his, I believe it was an eight inch Cox that he used, an eight inch refractor that he used. What is interesting about the discovery was at the time Saturn was only 15 degrees above the horizon from his location and it only culminated at 17 degrees so it was very low to the horizon so uh, this picture which is the discovery picture was one of as many observations he could make leading up to the discovery uh, and he spent a great deal of time going back to the subject and back to the subject to get as much detail as he could and then he made the discovery and he telephoned immediately the president of the royal astronomical association uh, uh, dr stevenson who then sent out alerts around the world, presumably by telegram at that time. And so his discovery was then officially confirmed by a professional at the US Naval Observatory in Washington about 26 hours later. <clears throat> so I think this just reiterates for me, one of the biggest things the amateur community can offer over the professional community is the sheer amount of time and dedication that they can pour into one subject professionals could not then and cannot now devote expensive observatory time unless something new appears which forces them to reallocate resources. So I do want to move forward now to, to more current observations, uh, but I will just be popping back in a minute to mention a few other observers after World War II that it would perhaps be a sin to ignore. But just now I'm going to jump forward from Will Hayes' discovery to this one. Anthony Wesley, 2010. Uh, now, I just say this picture of Saturn is not actually the discovery picture. This was one taken later on about December 2010. He made the discovery in March, but I don't have that actual picture with me. Um, but Anthony Wesley was an Australian amateur, and he was the first to discover the break, outbreak of this storm on Saturn, uh, on Saturn. And he notified NASA the next day. But what is interesting is that NASA, uh, the European Space Agency and the Italian Space Agencies had the Cassini probe in orbit around Saturn at the time and they hadn't noticed. Uh, all right, they may have been preoccupied with other tasks, but I, I kind of think of this as if you think of, of Saturn as being a sort of out of town Tesco's, then they had Cassino circling around the car park looking for a, a convenient place. Uh, and in this analogy, Anthony Wesley was sat on a hill uh, with his telescope five counties away, and he still managed to find a parking space first. Cassini was able to study the storm in great detail once they knew it was there. Uh, and here's an aftermath picture that they got in 2010. Uh, and they determined that this was the largest and hottest stratospheric vortex ever detected in the solar system. Initially, uh, well, eventually larger than the Great Red Spot on Jupiter itself. And these events seem to recur roughly every 30 years. And it is very likely that the next one will be discovered by an amateur, probably in the near infrared, using a methane band filter, where these hot events show up well before they be, appear in visible light. But I just have to show you this picture before I move on, which was a picture taken by, by me in April 2010 after Anthony's discovery had been declared. Uh, and if you look very carefully, you might just be able to see a little white spot outbreak in this position around here. Um, this demonstrates two things, I think. The first one it demonstrates is that when it comes to me making Saturn observations, I have absolutely terrible timing. And the other thing it demonstrates is that a UK observer with a small telescope could easily have made this discovery. Well, I'm going to just jump back now uh, before looking at some more of Wesley's discoveries. I must mention a couple of other guys who are certainly worthy of a, a, a mention. Um, Robert Burnham Jr. I said I was talking about planetary things in particular, but I do have to mention Robert Burnham Jr. He was an amateur who discovered a, a comet uh, with his own homemade telescope, received great notoriety and was shortly thereafter snapped up by the Lovell Observatory uh, to become a professional observer and discovered more comets after that. 
but his main thing is really the writing of these three volumes containing masses of information on deep sky objects but i i want to mention it in particular because the first hundred pages uh contains a, a sort of summary of everything you might need to know uh when you start up in astronomy um they had chapters called introducing the universe and fundamental knowledge for the observer and in my opinion the first hundred pages should really be printed up as a pamphlet uh, and handed out for free with every new telescope that that's how good the information is from this guy um, another uh, a great proponent of amateur astronomy i think and distributor of knowledge was sir patrick moore now i know that he's a little bit of a marmite figure i don't know if you can see me mug marmite there you go patrick's a little bit of a marmite figure you either love him or you hate him uh and i don't want to get into discussing politics or anything like this because i think if you went back and looked at any of the sort of children of empire and of a paternalistic colonial society you might find something to feel uncomfortable about in in any of their political views but you must applaud the excellent work that was done by these individuals and in patrick's case i have to say i found him personally i didn't know him very well but i knew him well enough i found him unfailingly helpful and generous and supportive and more importantly, I think his written body of work and TV performances, performances were always interesting and informative and aimed at the amateur. And when he died, I think the amateur community lost a distinctive public voice, which hasn't yet been recaptured on TV. Now, there are many more I could cover. Uh, Fred Price, I've got his the Planet Observer's Handbook in front of me. There is Peter Grigo and Neil Bone, excellent writers. Uh, there's guys like Grote Reber, who for 25 years was the only radio astronomer on earth and an amateur and conducted the first radio sky survey and discovered noises coming from the radiation belts and jupiter in radio frequencies um, i could discuss john dobson uh, who invented the dobsonian mount um, and those pictures taken by martin lewis at the beginning are taken on a telescope on a dobsonian mount but I am going to have to bypass a lot of these people just because time is moving on. So I apologize for that. And if your own particular favorite has been neglected, then please blame me and nobody else. So I'm going to come back to Anthony Wesley and uh, 2009. This is Anthony Wesley at his observing site in Australia with the Newtonian that he uses. And in that year, 2009, he discovered a new dark scar resulting from an asteroidal impact in the cloud layers of Jupiter. Now, you will recall the great impacts of fragments from comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 on Jupiter in July 1994, and the shock waves concerning the sheer size of these impacts and the explosions on a planet itself many, many times larger than Earth. Oh, incidentally, uh, David H. Levy, the co-discoverer co of the comet, was an amateur himself. Um, but while these huge impacts could have been observed from earth it was thought that smaller ones could never be seen by amateurs and that professionals didn't have the time to devote to look for them um, therefore it wouldn't be possible to make an accurate assessment of the rate of impacts um, on jupiter and, and by extension therefore the threat to earth but i thought you might just like to see this video as long as it plays it's uh, i'll just double click it see if it plays do something there you go wham that is the explosion of one of the fragments hitting jupiter there the other bright spot was one of the uh, inner moons reflecting sunlight so it gives you an idea of the scale of the explosions but wesley uh, in 2010 proved you can discover impact events from earth of much smaller objects uh, and here's his image showing an object of about 20 tons exploding in the atmosphere of Jupiter. This is one frame taken from a video stream. So you might wonder how uh, amateurs like uh, Wesley are able to make these discoveries. How did he manage this? Well, it's actually due to the tireless work of another group of amateurs who have developed easy to use, but immensely powerful computer software, which they've made available for free to the amateur community. Now, 
I'm not going to bang on about lucky imaging, uh, but just to say in general, the way it's done is to shoot video a minute or two long, you might have 20,000 frames of video, a lot of which are distorted by the Earth's atmosphere. You couldn't possibly sort through them by hand. So computer programs have been written to allow uh, these videos to be sorted through the finest frames taken out, stacked and aligned on top of each other to average out the noise. And the result of doing that is to produce a picture which looks like it might have been taken from space rather than from, you know, somebody's back garden in Romford. And mathematically and in terms of computer program, these bits of software are extremely complex and high end. And we should all give thanks to the time devoted to them by amateurs, for amateurs. Programs such as Registax, AVI Stack, Auto Stacker, you may well have heard of. There are others like PIP, Planetary Imaging Preprocessor, and various others, which produce very, very good planetary pictures. But what they don't do is actually pick out frames that have got bright flashes in them. So yet another group of amateurs set up this website, which you can uh, easily navigate to, from which you can download another piece of software, Detect, by these uh, gentlemen who have all helped with its development. These run through those videos and look for the bright flashes and make sure they're not one-offs like cosmic ray spikes, but actually appear in two or three or four subsequent frames. And from the work that's come from Detect software, we've managed to say that there are probably on average about seven small detectable impacts on Jupiter each year, at least two a year are, are significant. Um, so these, these are just some of the picture uh, impacts that are going back from the original uh, Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 and then Wesley's discoveries and then up into 2021, Jose Luis Pereira in Brazil uh, made other discoveries. So they've actually now turned their attention as well as Jupiter to Saturn uh, to look at those videos. And I suspect the first amateur who discovers uh, an impact on Saturn uh, will get a great deal of uh, publicity and make a name for themselves. So uh, maybe my timing will be slightly better uh, in that case. But from this, we can determine that it's perhaps not surprising that Earth gets one or two impact events of the order of Tunguska or Semipalatinsk per century. Um, I also made a mention earlier of the discovery of Clyde Spot. Uh, imaginatively named Clyde Spot, I thought. Clyde Foster, a South African amateur, May 2020, using a methane band filter, which I mentioned earlier, is the way we'll probably discover big storms on Saturn. He discovered a bright infrared hot spot here near the Great Red Spot and realized that the next pass of the Juno probe that was orbiting Jupiter at the time would be very close to it. Um, that would have been at the time uh, perigee of 27 for the Juno probe. So he immediately notified NASA. Now the Juno project run uh, by NASA actively encourages amateurs to submit their images so that professionals can judge uh, what's of interest to look at. And as you can see, Juno did its work some hours later and revealed Clyde's spot in the vis visible spectrum just here very bright in the infrared, pretty much undetectable from Earth in visual at this stage. But it's gone on to develop, to darken and to stretch out into another of those south tropical disturbances that I was talking about. As far as discoveries go, I'm, I'm almost running out of time here, really. I must mention, finally, uh, a little bit of a mystery discovered by amateurs. Uh, two um, extremely bright and high altitude atmospheric plumes observed on Mars. Now, that was observed by roughly 18 different amateurs in two 10 day periods in both March and April 2012. These are amateur pictures up here on the top left. And you can just see the plumes here circled and they're on the morning terminator. Uh, and uh, south up, south pole, they are all over a region on Mars known as Terra Cimmeria, if I pronounce that correctly. Uh, and when these discoveries were made and the professionals started scratching their head 
NASA went back and looked through its own uh, Hubble Space Telescope pictures and found in 1997 these pictures of the same sort of cloud. In fact, this is a north up picture. I should have taken the time to turn them the right way up. And if I would have done that, you'd have seen the orientation and placing of these clouds would have been identical over the Mare Cimmerium with the amateur ones. Now, they're, they're, they're fantastic clouds. They go up 200, 250 kilometers. They're a thousand miles long, 500 kilometers, sorry, a thousand kilometers long, 500 kilometers wide east west. Now, there's no dust storm on Mars that can throw stuff up to that kind of altitude. And it's unreasonable to say that it's due to impact events happening in the same place, uh, separated by many years, uh, and also separated by 10 days, you know, month to month, throwing up dust into the atmosphere. So what is causing them? And this is this is a mystery and professionals would dearly love to get more photographs of these events. I mean, there's lots of propositions. Some people have suggested that they coincide with the impact of coronal mass ejections uh, on uh, Mars, interacting with a, a weak magnetic anomaly, which is known in the area under the plumes. But if these are some sort of space weather auroral effects, then it implies a sort of northern lights activity, orders of magnitude brighter than you get on Earth. So another amateur discovery, which the professionals missed, um, and we need to know what's causing them. Uh, in this age of sort of internet echo chambers and, and fanciful conspiracy theories, there are, of course, some ridiculous little green men theories running about. And in a, in a roundabout way, that brings me to a conclusion uh, concerning the contributions of amateurs to planetary science. Um, because they've done a number of things in the past and will continue to do a number of things in the future, not just specifically to do with the planets. What roles can amateurs play? Well, they can and they will continue to make actual discoveries on the planets and elsewhere. And in fact, I only heard recently that uh, exoplanets in the in data provided by professionals have now been found by amateurs and it won't be terribly long before the amateurs are finding completely their own exoplanets from their own data uh, they have provided a legacy of detailed observations which may be data mined for future discoveries i must mention uh, alan w heath He's a, a regular contributor to the section. He's recently turned 90 years old and he's just put 18,000 observations uh, on record with the BAA, which are available there for, for data mining and research. Uh, third thing that we can do is we can do outstanding work in providing tools to further amateur astronomy. The uh, computer analysis of videos uh, is, is just outstanding and will continue and improve and there are other tools being provided to help amateur uh, observers which will loop back to number one and allow the discovery of uh, well new discoveries but finally I must just mention this amateurs can reach out to the general public with and that's important accurate and useful information explaining the workings of the solar system I was fairly horrified recently to find out the extent of what is referred to as YouTube science and the fact that a lot of young people are questioning the legacy of science from the past because they haven't got active experience themselves of it. And there are things like genuine websites with 200, 300,000 subscribers forcing out misinformation about, for example, a flat earth, a flat earth in this day and age. So all of us can reach out to the general public with accurate and useful information. So I think the role of amateurs is important. That's basically my little presentation about 45 minutes. I hope it wasn't too long, too boring, and I hope you found it at least partially of interest. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alan. And that was really interesting. It's one of the most interesting talks we've had, I think, because it covered all sorts of material that I hadn't heard before. And it really went into a lot of detail. So it wasn't just this 
usual sort of uh, gloss over it. It, it really um, taught me a lot, and I was very pleased to see that. Um, Indeed, yes, very interesting. Thank you um, for that. And uh, stop that. Sorry. Oh. That, um, yeah, wonderful uh, talk. And uh, thank you uh, both to Alan and to Robin for the talks after the break. And thanks again today to Garant for the, uh, Garant Jones for the, um, uh, the, the main talk about Comet Interceptor. So, that's um, an excellent, uh, uh, excellent afternoon. And um, actually just a couple of things came up in the, in the chat. So John Murrell uh, points out that um, uh, there's an ISS pass this evening around 1807. So not too long now. Um, so it's looking clear outside from uh, through UK. my window. So you yeah, might so well see it. Clear skies to everybody. Yep, magnitude minus 3.8. And um, also Clive um, from Wales um, mentions Richard Baum, uh, who, with, uh, who he knew when he lived in Chester. So thank you for, for that. And um, yeah, so fascinating. And uh, as we heard earlier, actually with Geraint's talk and, and the questions afterwards, uh, certainly, you know, observations are really useful in terms of looking at comets and things like that as well as the planet so and certainly that storm in uh, on jupiter was uh, was an amazing discovery and was followed up of course by cassini and, uh, and other things so uh, i guess um if there are no other questions um i guess it just remains today to uh, to thank everybody again and to say that um the next meeting is going to be on the 30th of april at two o'clock and so uh, that actually will be in um, in person, so in the Institute of Physics um, in London. It will also be streamed online for those who can't make it directly for the, to the meeting, uh, but it will be Professor Graziella Branduardi raymond um, who will be talking about exploring the solar system in x-rays. Um, so it should be very interesting. Graziella um, started her career as a uh, X-ray astronomer, but uh, she's now turned her view to the solar system and indeed leads another space, space mission, which um, uh, which European Space Agency will be doing. So that'll be fascinating. And um, that is on 30th of April. So thank you very much to all the contributors to today. And um, thank you very much. And I uh, guess we can stop the recording. Thank you very much, everybody. Anything else to add, Robin? That's all. Thank you very much indeed to everyone for watching and got there in the end. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. All right. Thanks.